Jesus did not let his bride die. He did not let his flock be destroyed. He did not let his church, which he built, be prevailed against. And he did not let his kingdom, which he planted, be uprooted. Jesus gives straightforward assurance that the church would persist. He says, quote, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. At the end of Matthew, Jesus commissions his disciples with a view to the evangelism of all the nations. And he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Ephesians 5, Jesus is described as a groom to his bride, the church. He cherishes her. He died for her. He cleanses her with the water of the word. In John 10, Jesus is the good shepherd who faithfully tends to his flock and effectively gathers his sheep. Jesus says that he chose his disciples to go and bear fruit that abides. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, we have parables about the uninterrupted growth of the kingdom. We'll start with the parable of the wheat and tares. In the parable of the wheat and tares, you have two sowers. The first sows the good seed in the field, and while his men are sleeping, the enemy comes and sows weeds. His men ask the master, do you want us to uproot the weeds? And the master declines, saying that to do so would, uh, would uproot the wheat. Then he says, let both grow together until the harvest. Jesus then gives his own interpretation. He literally helps you out with the interpretation of it. He says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Joseph Smith saw this parable as a threat to his great apostasy narrative. BYU professor Charles Harrell rightly observes, quote, DNC 86.3 recasts this parable as a reference to the apostasy, explaining that the tares, quote, choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. This, still quoting Harrell here, this altered rendering changes the sense of the parable from the biblical account where the wheat wasn't choked but continued to grow and was gathered safely into the barn. There is never any mention, even in the New Testament interpretation, Jesus' own interpretation, of the parable that the children of the kingdom would be overcome or that a second growing season, i.e. a restoration, would be necessary. This parable, as it stands, consistently fits the New Testament perspective that the kingdom would survive any perils until the Savior's return. So to Jesus, this is not about, this is me now, so to Jesus, this is not about the, sorry, to Jesus, this is about the survival and perpetual growth of the kingdom. But to Joseph Smith, this parable was partly about the destruction and the replanting of the kingdom. Charles Harrell goes on, other parables in Matthew 13 convey a similar idea of the kingdom's gradual, uninterrupted growth. The parable of the mustard seed, for example, indicates that the kingdom that Christ set up was to begin small, but would gradually grow into a huge, large, mature tree. Joseph Smith, however, interpreted the parable as representing, quote, the churches that shall come forth in the latter days, with the mustard seed symbolizing the Book of Mormon sprouting out of the earth. Finally, there is the parable of the leaven, which was put into three measures of meal until the whole was leavened. This seems to convey the same idea as the other parables, a gradual spreading growth of the kingdom that Christ established. According to Joseph Smith, however, this parable refers to the latter days as, quote, the church of the latter-day saints as it has taken its rise from a little leaven that was put into the three witnesses. So, no more Harold, this is me now. So while Jesus gives us kingdom growth parables that entail a durable, perpetual kingdom with a single growing season, with gradual, uninterrupted growth, Joseph Smith takes a chainsaw to the words of Jesus and violates them to suit his own purpose. My friends, this was not faithful to the gospel or to the words of Jesus. This was not humble. This was arrogant of Joseph Smith. On May 26, 1844, Joseph Smith preached the following as reported by his trusted clerk, Thomas Bullock. Quote, I have more to boast of than any man ever had. 
I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. <clears throat> to this, we Christians say, quote, Psalm 40, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. My friends, Latter-day Saints, whom I love, give God glory for what he did in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus set up a church that would not be prevailed against. He has a bride that he didn't let die. Jesus has a flock that he has effectively gathered and protected, and he planted a kingdom that did not need a second growing season. In Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Christians are grateful for that. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. In Ephesians 3.21, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever.